Welcome to the School of Batman, a podcast where we ask academics to help Batman fight crime using their research. I'm your host, Chris George, amateur scientist and professional Batman enthusiast. And in today's episode, we'll be discussing the case of Supergirl and the Laser Fists. We're pleased to be joined by Matthew Partridge, who has a PhD in fiber optic sensors from Cranfield University and is currently a postdoctoral research fellow at Cranfield University. He's also a bigger Batman fan than me. Matthew, we'd like to start the podcast with a bit of background on yourself, your academic journey, and what inspired your choices and some details about your research. So, tell us what you do. Hi there, thanks for having me. I am a postdoctoral research fellow in fibre optic sensors, as you mentioned. My history in science started a bit earlier. My first degree was in biochemistry, which I spent three years doing up at Lancaster University. And from that, I learned all about different biochemical processes and detecting things. And I took that first, not back to university to do a PhD, but back into industry, where I spent some time working on cancer diagnostics uh, for a small biomedical company. And we specifically made things that could detect cancer from single drops of blood using color changing tests. But I loved my time in industry. I wanted to do something that was more exciting with my research, more cutting edge. So I came back to academia and I studied at Cranfield to get a PhD in fiber optics where we use fiber optics as the detector for some of that color change chemistry. So we can detect things using fiber optics rather than relying on looking at little bits of paper changing color. Okay, so I'm gonna get you to take a right step back here because I know the term fiber optics solely through how I get my internet. Um, so what are fiber optics? Look first, what, how would you describe fiber optics in a sentence? Fiber optics are strands of glass that excel at taking light from one end to the other without anything changing. So a strand of glass makes me think that that is flexible. Um, is that correct? Because like my own experience of glass is windows. Yeah, so these are fibres of glass, clues in the name, and they are about the thickness, about twice the thickness of a human hair. So they are very flexible and bendy, and the unique sort of structures within that glass make them very flexible, so that you can bend and twist them and do all sorts of things. You can in fact sort of wrap them around in coils, you can have them running throughout buildings everywhere you want them to go and they can they're very strong at that if you pull on one they can take about 70 kilograms force before they'll break so is there anything like different to the glass in a in a fiber optic cable than the glass that i would have in my window is, is it something to do with it being small that enables it to be bendy and twisty or is it is it glass in kind of glass in name only so it's glass in the same way it's glass in your window. And the very first fiber optics were just the same glass that people were making windows out of back in the 1800s. It was just simply some molten silica. Um, and in that case, it was attached to a crossbow bolt and fired across a lab. And that created behind it this very, very thin strand of molten glass coming out behind it. And that the sort of the, the thickness of that or the sort of the, the bendiness that comes from it isn't just because it's very thin. It comes from it because of the way the stresses in the glass line up as that molten glass comes and falls out and creates cools behind the crossbow bolt, as it was back in the 1800s. Um, nowadays, fiber optics are actually made up of a, a kind of big mix of different types of glass with different additives and dopants and colors and all sorts of different things for different applications. Um, and in fact, you can even get fiber optics made out of things like rubies. Uh, so you're saying they're used for transporting light. How is my internet transported as light? That sounds like some kind of fever dream of a sentence. What, what, what is actually going on there? Well, how your internet is transported as light is kind of the same as it would be transported as electricity in so much as it's a series of ones and zeros that are sort of sent down, in this case, an optical fiber as opposed to a copper fiber. Um, the optical fiber is better because you get a lot further transmission with very little loss in signal. So you could send a hundred ones and zeros, 
a long way without any of them turning up at the other end slightly wrong. Now, there's a lot of sort of signal processing that goes into how those are transmitted, but essentially that's the biggest advantage from copper to fibre optics is just how far you can send those signals with as little error and noise as, as, as possible. Because I have I have some binary on one side of the room. I have some kind of machine in the middle that transcodes it to whatever is sent through the cable, and then whatever is sent through comes out pretty much perfectly on the other side. Is that that's that's broadly it? And I think the the furthest record to date that a signal has been sent through a fiber optic cable and recovered is roughly the distance from here to the sun and back um, through a single fiber optic cable. So you were saying you were using these as part of fiber optic sensors. Um, so what's what's the connection between the fiber optic cables that we all kind of know and, and, and a sensor? Well, fiber optic cables are fantastic because, as I said, you can get a signal from A to B with nothing in the middle changing, um, which is brilliant for Netflix episodes, but terrible for sensing. Sensing, you want something to change between A and B, and you want it to change in a way that tells you something about the conditions in between. So while most of the research into fiber optics has focused on making fiber optics so that they do that A to B job very, very well, our research focuses on making them do that job less well. And at certain points of the fibre, you instead of having the light pass through unimpeded, you make parts that are sort of leaky to the light, or I suppose leaky to the environment, so that things like temperature will start to affect the light that passes through. And there's a large number of different ways you can do this, and what you're really trying to do there is change some way the spectrum of the light that's coming through. So if you have put in white light, you would might want the at the other end a little bit of blue light to now be missing. And if your fibre gets hot, a little bit more blue light is missing or a little bit less blue light is missing. So in that way you can use the output of the fibre to tell you what's happening in the environment around it. So this research seems quite um, uh, like quite cross-discipline really it seems like you need to know a lot about engineering physics biology is that an accurate read on on what you're doing yes i'd say that that very much is it requires people who understand the chemical environment in which you're trying to do your sensing application the physics of the fibers and the engineering involved in putting the fibers into the position that they are that they need to be in um in the short time that that Cranford University has been working on this, they've done things like they've embedded fibres inside concrete piles to look at the propagation of explosives in concrete. We've put fibres into breath detection for cancer diagnostics. Um, we've strung fibres out on planes. We've put them in sort of almost zero degree Kelvin cryostat equipment. A, a big mix of different applications and that mostly requires having chemists, physicists and engineers all trying to find a way of making this work together. It's a very multidisciplinary sensor and a very multidisciplinary sort of area of research. And how do you work in practice with uh, a team like that? So you ha are you all um, kind of domain, domain specific experts and then you'll collaborate digitally? Are you all in a room? How, how does that work? Uh, the trick is mostly having lots of coffee. Um, the best way to, to do collaborations is to meet each other on a regular basis and, and have coffee. We're quite a multidisciplinary group, so we there's a lot of different people from a lot of different fields, not necessarily always working on the same project, but we work in the same labs, we see each other almost every other day, and that's a very productive way of making sure that you kind of talk to each other about your own problems. And sometimes you don't even know that you've got a problem that's solvable. You think you've got a problem that you're, you know, I'm trying to solve with some chemical process and I'll be kind of griping about it over a cup of coffee one day and my colleague will sort of laugh and say, oh, no, 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 this is this is very solvable. You just need to use this piece of statistics. Uh, and all of a sudden my problem is fixed. Um, it, it's about that sort of communicating between all the different fields. So some amazing uses for fibre optics there. So let's get to your story and see if there's any more amazing uses. Um, so before we start, who are you going to choose to play your Batman in your story? Um, so uh, this, this, this is brilliant because this is a podcast. So the most important part for me is the voice of Batman. And the voice of Batman to me is Kevin Conroy. 
who plays Batman in the animated series. Um, and for me, the sound of his voice, that is Batman. That is everything that Batman embodies to me is his excellent portrayal of Batman in the in the DC animated series. Um, so for me, there is no other Batman, there's no other sound of Batman than Kevin Conroy. A superb choice and a man after my own heart. Um, so yes, story time. Darkseid is plotting to kill the Batman for good. He's lured Supergirl into his kingdom of apocalypse and has shown her the anti-life equation, which has removed her free will, leaving her under his control. He installs her as the head of the female Furies and they close in on Gotham. A trap is set and the fight begins. Supergirl powers up her laser vision, takes aim on Batman and lets rip. Nothing could withstand such a blast, not even our hero. Or could he? So Matthew, Batman is being pounded with Supergirl's laser vision. How on earth could fiber optics help him here? Well, I think the the in the comics, often the, the fix for Supergirl or the fix for fighting Superman, it's always kryptonite, which I think is a really sort of, you know, it's the go-to comic book writer's weapon. I, I think it overlooks modern advances in fiber optics. What Batman needs is a bit of fiber optic technology that allows him not to bring a weapon specifically that targets Supergirl, but actually can use Supergirl against herself. And the thing that Supergirl, Superman, and all the sort of the super family tend to use a lot of, especially when they've been turned evil, when they seem to just cut rip with their laser vision, is those glowing eyes and shooting lasers out left, right, and center, burning everything they can in sight. Now, this is where fiber optics excel, because there's one thing that fiber optics are very commonly used for, and that's moving lasers or projecting lasers into different places. There's fiber lasers that can operate at sort of 200 kilowatts power, huge amounts of energy. And so what Batman needs here is to couple some of that technology into his bat suit and particularly in his fists. So if he has fiber optics running from one fist all the way around his arms, up over his shoulders and down to the other fist, he can take laser light into the fibers on one fist and shoot them out of the other fist. In fact, returning the laser vision to Supergirl. So as she fires them at him, he can punch the lasers, coupling them into the fiber optics out the other fist and uppercut her with her own laser vision. Um, I mean, that's remarkable. Um, have you had experience of this kind of laser redirecting? Um, when you were uh, doing it, if you have done it, um, did you think, cool, blimey, Batman could use this? Because uh, like, it sounds completely science fiction, um, the answer to this. And I know it's not. I know it's, I know it's actual hardcore science so there's a bit of artistic license in the explanation of what you can do but there's also a lot of actual possible science so first of all we don't know how powerful superman's laser beams are i, I realize there is a huge amount of data in comics and we could have a very long discussion over what his relative power levels are but basically they change depending on what the author really wants it to be able to do and as i'm the author of this story i'm deciding that we can definitely cope with the energy that the, the supergirl's eyes are being are able to output um, but then what you've got is you've got the laser light coming into the fibers. Now, to get light into fibers and to get that total internal reflectance, which enables the light to be captured and then reflected all the way down the fibers, fiber optics have something called the cone of acceptance. And this is like a, an imaginary, if you imagine the end of a fiber and imagine this little cone coming out. And that cone is like the region in which if you have light coming in at that angle into the fiber, it will be captured inside the fiber and it will be totally internally reflected down the fiber and that's the sort of the cone in which batman has to manage to get the laser light coming into the fibers on his fist um, now I, I don't see that as a problem batman is a master of agility trained at all kinds of special martial arts i think he would be able to position his fist in just the right way to couple 
uh, Supergirl's uh, eyes into his his uh, fiber optics on his fist. So I think I think that's doable within the scope of comics. The next is the sort of the containing that amount of power in the in, in the glass. And you may think it's sort of huge amounts of sort of like plasma like energy rippling through this glass. Well, actually, when sort of lasers travel through the air, you, you don't see them. They, there's no like rippling kind of heat coming off the sort of region they're passing through because they're doing that. They're passing through that space. They're not reacting with it. Take a take a step back. They're passing through that space. So you're not you don't see a laser because it doesn't bounce off anything. It doesn't react. It doesn't you know, nothing in the, the place of that. If you put a piece of paper in the way, it will instantly probably set on fire if it's strong enough laser. But the laser is going from, from the point where it starts to wherever you're shining it, and it isn't sort of radiating energy and heat all the way along. The, if, you, if you sort of put your hand very, very close to the laser beam, you won't feel anything um, because it's not, gener it's not generating heat. There's nothing for it to generate heat off. It's just light going from A to B, in this case, through air. And the same is true inside the glass fibre. It's just being transmitted through the glass. It's not radiating energy. It's not coming out. It's, it's coming, coming, coming in at one end and out the other end. And there is a certain amount of interaction with the glass and there will be some heat generated in, in fibre lasers, which already do this, but it, instead of redirecting lasers, they actually generate the laser inside the fibre. In that case, you, you have a lot of sort of cooling and things like that to, to sort of try and dump the heat and, uh, uh, and things. But uh, again, I, I, th I think, you know, Batman almost certainly has a water-cooled bat suit. Um, so I, I, th I think that's possible. So um, that would be a sort of a solvable problem. Um, a, you know, if we take his agility, his ability to couple the laser light into the fibers, that those those fibers, those glass fibers, um, can take that sort of energy. The you can get ones that um, so some of them are are solid glass. The ones that are on the, the higher energy end can also be hollow glass fibers. So in that case, you have a sort of a a ring of glass and inside the middle is air uh, and along the sort of the inside of the tube the the tube is coated coated with something like silver and so that the silver is then used to bounce the light down the what what is now a sort of glass tube i suppose um and and out the other end and those are also used in sort of more sort of high energy laser coupling applications so you're saying um, it, the, about the interruption of the laser, and that's when you can see some interactions with it. Is that is that a binary state? Either it's interrupted or it's not. Or no. So if uh, if for example you had a smoke machine, you'll obviously start to see the laser because the laser will start hitting some of the smoke particles. But what you're getting there is is as the laser's passing through that smoke that smoke has a sort of absorbance so it is absorbing some of that laser which is then being given off as light and a little bit of heat um, so by having that in the way you then lose some of that power so the more stuff you have for the light to interact with then the less light you're going to have out the other side of it it will all be um, absorbed wow could, can a laser go in a, a laser couldn't could a laser work in a vacuum uh, lasers work very well in a vacuum because there's nothing in the way. Um, and some of the, the highest energy lasers have parts of them that are within vacuums or, or are often sometimes entirely within vacuums to try and get the highest energy output and to, to not cause problems with things like laser optics, for example. If you had interference on those optics, like a little speck of dust, on some very high precision lasers, that's a massive problem. So some of those laser optics can be within sort of vacuum conditions. So what would stop a laser in a vacuum? Um, your hand. <laughs> I mean, just a thing in the way, something that was then absorbent to that laser, that wavelength of laser. So if you have, um, for example, a, a, an infrared laser, um, well, we can stop that with a bit of perspex because perspex is opaque to infrared. So you just put a bit of perspex in. I can see through the perspex but my infrared laser doesn't go through that perspex. Um, we have um, UV lasers um, at Cranfield, and those can be stopped by sort of UV filtering materials. In fact, some of those lasers can be just stopped by plain glass because normal glass in windows isn't that transparent to UV. Um, whereas it is very obviously very transparent if I had a green laser or a red laser. 
So theoretically, if you had the right kind of laser in the right kind of vacuum, uh, this is more the question I was trying to reach for. Is there like a, a principle or a theory or something like that that would mean that the laser would stop at some point if that vacuum was endless? Or would it in theory go on forever? The, the answer to your question really simply is um, if you shine a laser and there's nothing to stop it, it won't stop. You will get a bright light forever. The thing is, but what makes a laser a laser isn't just the fact that you have a bright light in a narrow beam. Um, it's the fact that you get something called coherence. And coherence is where all of... So if you, if, if, if you think about light as a wave, a wiggly wave, an up and down wave, um, in a laser, all of the wiggles all go at the same time. So all of the ups are at the up and all of the downs are at the down. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. So every bit of light, but then... As you get further away from the laser, they become less coherent. Um, and so that you get a little bit of, kind of, it just moves out of sync a little bit. So some are now up and some are halfway down and some are down. It's starting to sound like a nursery rhyme. And that's what the sort of then it doesn't have the same energy, even though it has the same light, because not everything is peaking at the same time. And so that's what's called a coherence length. But the laser, the light that you'd see would go on forever. It just wouldn't be a laser as such anymore. So what causes the breakdown of that coherence? Uh, quality of the laser. So different lasers have different quality um, and make the light in different ways and have different stated coherence lengths. Um, and so it depends. So if it's a bit like a kind of like an angle problem where if, if you're trying to shoot two laser pointers at the moon, um, if there is one, you know, a tenth of a degree out between them, so one's pointing a tenth of a degree slightly different to the other one, they'll be a long way apart by the time they hit the moon. But if you said try to measure that difference a meter away from the laser pointers, you won't see any. It will look like they're perfectly straight. It's because that tiny little error has to then build up over a long length of time. And so that sort of that coherence problem builds up, I suppose. Is it theoretically possible to build like an infinite um, coherence laser or is that is that outside of the realms of reality? No, it's, it's theoretically possible, but it's. It's the, the problem is that it is only theoretically possible. It's not practically possible. <laughs> um, it, it's theoretically very possible to have a lot of theoretical light that all does exactly the same thing in exactly the same conditions. Just practically, that probably isn't possible. I, I think e at some point, even things like the interference of cosmic rays would probably start messing with your equipment and making it so, sort of deviate to a point. You can get lasers with incredibly long coherence lengths, but... That's it, it depends on certain applications you don't need it, and most of the applications like the applications I for, for preparing sensors, you don't need it. So it, it's one of those things that you, you only would do that if you need it. You don't always need it. Um, and if you're sort of Superman and or Supergirl generating huge amounts of power, you probably don't need the coherence length because you've got all of that power anyway. Okay, so we're going to move on to some of the other potential uh, things that fiber optics could help Batman with. So... I specialise in fibre optic sensors, and a big part of what makes Batman Batman is the fact that he is the world's greatest detective. And he turns up a crime scenes and he analyses the crime scenes for their various different properties, and he looks for things like Joker's serum and stuff like that. And that's where fibre optics are brilliant. And in fact, they, they sort of already seem to exist in the comics. In the latest edition of um, The Court of Owls, Batman has a tiny fibre that comes out of the end of his finger, and he uses that to take and test samples while he's at crime scenes. Now, that is something that exists. We have fibre optics that do exactly that, that you can poke a material and it tells you a little bit about that materials properties. So some of them work a bit like a spectrophotometer and we can give you a spectroscopic output of what those materials are and others you coat the fibre in a material that changes when it is put into something that you're looking for. So in a, in a very simple sensor you could have the on the end of the fibre you could put some pH indicator. You could put something that changes colour if the pH is a little bit different. So for example if there's some boiling at that and Batman wants to know if it's made of the lovely acid that created the Joker, he can 
add his fiber optic and the fiber optic will give him an instant readout for what that pH is simply by looking at the light that comes down the fiber all the way to the tip and then is reflected off the end of that tip back up the fiber. And as that pH sensitive material changes color, that then changes the sort of light or the way that the light is reflected back to some sort of reading system that would then be able to give Batman a live feed out of what the sort of material was, was well, what the pH of the material was. Could you elaborate a little bit more on the first one about the, um, what did you call it, a, spectros a spectroscopic system? That is where what you're simply doing there is you're using fiber optics as a convenient way of taking light into and out of a sample. So what you have there is you would have a fiber, or it might even be the, the same fiber, you have a fiber that, that takes in white light and another fiber that looks at the light that is being reflected or transmitted through a material and looks at the spectrum of the light that's coming back. And in that way, you could create a sort of a, a, a fiber optic spectrophotometer and that these exist these are these are probes that you can buy you can go and get little fiber optic spectro spectrophotometers um, that you can sort of prod into materials and it will give you some sort of spectral information about what they're made up of so that could tell me quite intimate information on say the breakdown of some rubber or or something like that like the the origin of a particular type of leather well, spectroscopy has its limits and spectroscopy can be interfered with by a great number of things. So, so the act of just knowing the, the spectral output of material doesn't tell you everything. And in some cases, you can easily confuse several different materials f which might have the same spectral output. And that's where the idea of making them then sensitive to a specific thing that you're looking for, especially if you know that you're looking for a particular explosive compound or if you're looking for a particular drug, then you can put receptors to that material on the fiber. So instead of detecting a sort of a, a more general spectrum, you can actually get a very specific response that will only occur if you have that thing present. Right, so it's less what is this, more is this what I think it is. Yes, so which is a lot kind of safer way of, of knowing exactly whether or not that material is present. And you can, the, the size of fiber optics allows you to do a, a number of these tests all at the same time. You don't just have to have one test necessarily. These are, again, the thickness of a human hair. So you can have multiple fibers doing multiple things. Um, and you would know for each one of those whether or not you had a particular material and what the concentration of that material was in some cases. So if you wanted to know how much crude oil, for example, was in a water sample, you can know with some, some degree of accuracy to sort of the degree of part per million how much crude oil is there by putting in a fiber optic that has been sensitized specifically for crude oil. And the same is true of other things. So methane concentrations, various reactive gases, all of those can be detected. So you can wave a fiber optic in an airspace and know how much ammonium or ammonia is present in that air. And that can tell you a lot about what's been there before, what's happened and, and, and things like that. So if he was on, if Batman was on a crime scene, he might be able to tell when the last living person was in the room? People are brilliantly smelly and give off all kinds of volatiles. So that is well within what's possible. So is there any, gas is obviously a big part of the Batman universe. Is there anything that fibre optics can help Batman be protected from gas, not just sense gas? Yeah, so something else that fibre optics do, other than transmit light and act as sensor components, is that you can actually use them as sort of physical filtration material. So something that's in sort of modern dialysis machines, you use hollow core fibre or what is also kind of be also known as photonic fibers, where you have these fibers that are made up of many, many holes in the middle. And in the case of dialysis machines, liquids are passed through them. The holes are so small that they filter out materials and they can be used to grab materials as those materials go past. So should Batman be faced with trying to size up the scarecrow, he could create a face mask that could capture the toxins that the scarecrow produces and produce breathable air through those fiber filters those banks of hollow fibers so that's all for now thanks for listening and thanks to matthew partridge for joining us i was really it was really good fun i could have done that for about another three hours if if i'd been allowed to <laughs> 
If you'd like to discuss your research on a future episode, email us at info at pigshare.com.